Yama, Yama Garu, which in Morawari, Nemba, Kamilaroi means good day. How are you? I'd also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal nation in, uh, in which we, we live and stand these days. Um, reconciliation, like there's kind of two sides of it. I'm going to do my best to uh, um, show you some stuff and talk about my, my, uh, my view of it. <clears throat> well, back in my high school days, um, in business principles and bookkeeping, Reckon to balance your books was to reconcile your books. Later on, the word reconciliation comes in, and I thought, what's this mean? Is it going to be balancing things up from the from entries in red to make them come out and the books into black? To balance the books, so to speak. I had a look at, at Google for the definition of, rec of reconciliation and it goes on in volumes and volumes. <coughs> so much, so much there to look at. And, uh, and of course there's a, quite a fair smattering of reconciliation for Aboriginal people. You really can't deny the fact that the injustices of the past have been, have, 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 sorry, you can't deny the fact that the injustices of the past have happened. And it's not just the blackfellas that have copped it. Other countries have been affected too. A lot of them are colonised by the British Empire, like India, Ireland, Australia, Africa and other places. And it's not just about black and white thing, a black and white thing, it's about whites on white too. Nowadays it's an industry and it has its place in the government with government staff and uh, people to look after what they call reconciliation uh, business. This image I took on the 16th of August 1975 out at Wattie Creek in the Northern Territory. Then Prime Minister Gough Whitlam pouring soil into the hand of traditional Gurindji landowner Vincent Lingiari. On that particular day, we reshot the image. The first image was shot. You might notice there's a shed at the back. They call it a bow shed, where you put boughs of boughs of trees to make shade. And there was an obelisk in there with what had happened that day. And we photographed inside, and it was very quite dark. Um, Keith. Keith Barlow is a Women's Weekly for photographer. We both agreed that it didn't look real good inside in the, in the dark. So we, uh, he said, do you think we can get another shot outside of the, of, of the event? So when all, of, all the um, handing over and speeches were done, I asked Mr Whitlam, straight away I said would you mind coming out into the bright sunlight and we'll, we'll reshoot that picture again and he said very well <laughs> so I led him out to a spot not too far away and I said is it about here we do we'll do I said yes fine stay right there don't move so then I went inside and got dear uncle Vincent and his eyesight was not so good he had trachoma and I led him out and uh, I said uncle I'm going to take that picture again he said okay okay boy 
So out, out we go and let him out and I kind of propped him up into that position, his right hand, right hand out and left hand with the deeds of the land in his hand. And then Goff moved himself around to, to fill the frame. And uh, other people were there taking pictures, of course. And um, Keith Barlow said, get back, everybody. Merv's got first dibs at this. He's, he's organised it. And he said, then I'm next. He said, <laughs> and you can please yourselves after that. So I, I suppose I shot about six images on a Hasselblad, and, and it's not a real fast camera to use, but this was the image. What do you think of it? Mm. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of questions for some of the students here. Um, reconciliation. Uh, is it to you in, in your backyard, is it working effectively? Uh, what exactly do they, what exactly do they do? And what does it all mean? Another one. And what does it mean to you personally? Is it just about black fellas and white fellas getting on with one another? And for the artists, uh, creative artists that are here, could you create a piece of artwork about reconciliation? Don't know. It'd be nice to try. Listen, listening to the ABC Radio a, a, AM yesterday morning, and they ran a really good piece. It's um, Re Reconciliation Week. Um, and they had lots, lots of viewpoint, viewpoints from listeners. It mentioned that re reconciliation runs across all ethnic groups. And some of the listeners asked, was there a holistic approach to reconciliation? Was it a way to make people feel uh, with a feel-good attitude. It is really interesting that blackfellas are the guinea pigs here, that is with reconciliation. As we're the first ones to be messed around, hopefully the work that comes from all, the, all of this will benefit all Australians. In the old days, there's so much racism, and uh, and it's still alive. Um, and it's been well documented. People, people have been writing about it and making movies about it. So, what sort of movies have you seen about sort of racism, particularly? or oh, not so much in Australia, but in America. Movies like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, To Sir With Love, To Kill a Mockingbird, and In the Heat of the Night, with pretty well Master Sid Portier, the main actor. He wasn't in To Kill a Mockingbird. Gregory Peck was in that one. Um, I'll show you another couple of pictures. This, this is a... Um, I grew up in a little town called Brewarna, 800 kilometres from here, far west, northern New South Wales. It's my family, my sister Cynthia, my mother Marjorie, myself, and my father William, William Mervyn. He was a shearer and a shearer's cook. Mum uh, worked in the hotel, doing work, housework, taking in washing, and to, you know, to keep us at school. We, me and my sister never wanted for anything, clothes-wise, anything we wanted, we, we got it. Brewarna is situated on the Barwon River, and there 
there are rocks in the river placed by Aboriginal people as fish traps. They say they go back many thousands of years and it's, I think I believe it's on a heritage list. I was up in the Northern Territory and um, we, outside of Man and Greta, we came across this sign, um, kind of warning people that if you, when you're coming here, take only the, it's the bark painting, because you, when you say bark with the, with the two front teeth missing, you say park. Park painting is no money. But if you take a picture of someone or somebody else, it's $10. And if you take pictures of country or the landscapes, it's eleven dollars. And this is all going to this going all over the world to white men and blacks. I love I love signs. Wherever there's something like that, I'll, I'll stop and jump out and take a picture. Australia is pretty well multicultural. This was taken out at Bankstown last year um, at a youth development gathering and there were children there from um, many different um, countries of the world and all mixing in together. It was a fantastic day. My son Tim is a coordinator there and organised quite a lot on that particular day. Here we are, my family, or pretty well. Myself, my daughter Rosemary, her, her chap Isaac Gordon, son Tim, and his, and his lady Lucinda. Lucy. Mervyn, Rosemary, and Tim. I shot this uh, early last year for a piece in the um, show called Bungaree which is now touring uh, throughout New South Wales. It opened at Mossman Gallery. This is uh, my son Tim in poses of Bungaree, who was a notable Aboriginal person in the 1820s, as the native off, off the, out of the bush, as the uh, navigator who went around um, circumnavigated Australia, the first person to, first, first Australian to circumnavigate Australia with Matthew Flinders. They had a little farm over at Mossman where they were supposed to grow peaches and Bungaree was to, to sell them to people. But gardening was not in his, um, his book of things to do. And finally, of course, uh, the sailor. But um, yeah, we, we shot this in uh, um, Garrett Fockhammer's studio. It took us about about, a, about an hour. Yeah, we um, this this is brother Jimmy Little. God love him. He's he's now gone. He. He had, um, in his mind, was mild, gentle ways. He he meant a lot to Aboriginal people and a lot of um, a lot of other people too. In his songs, he used to always, uh, when he was out talking to people quite informally, he would he would talk about his five Ps. And here we go. The, the five P's were to have patience, perseverance, positiveness, punctuality, and pride. It's a nice guide, isn't it? And advice to folk um, going through life. This is my image, this is a similar image 
at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And Paul Kelly singing his um, that song from Little Things, Big Things Grow. Um, it felt pretty special. And a lot of people were quite tearful that night when uh, that image was up there, twice the size of this, and Paul, Paul singing that song. Dear brother Kevin Carmody, and Paul wrote that song. It's up in Brewarrina just the other week for Brewarrina's 150 years. Um, we met up with, with folks in the caravan park and the people that we'd known from way back were there too. So it was a good mixture of, can you say, reconciliation or re, regathering, re, reuniting. Um, and th this, is, this went on for a week. So there's a million other pictures as well, but uh, it's my cousin and his, and his partner and uh, some other, other folks that we'd known when we were young. Last year, um, I went over to China. And this image was a feature image of a, of an ex, in an exhibition called Making Change. This is the catalogue of that exhibition. All Aboriginal folk it was in the, um, I can never think of the name of the place. What's it called? Coma. Centre of the. Jeez. Pardon me. Ah, yeah. oh, dear, right, oh dear. I can never think of the name. Anyway, it's a coma or some, some name like that. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. There's a girl. But it's, it was quite, quite, a, um, quite an honour to have this work in there, in that exhibition. Then Senator Simon Crean was there to open the show and uh, it was the 40th anniversary of when Gough Whitlam went, first went to China and on the other side of the wall there were images of his father who had gone over with Gough at that, at, at that time and I don't think um, Simon had seen some of the images. Yeah. Um, Right now, I've got a, an exhibition opening, or on Thursday, at Bankstown Art Centre. You'll see a little flyer up the front, and there's some little flyers to take with you, should you want. I've been doing pictures of, um, or shooting pictures, images, portraits of Aboriginal folk, elders, and um, Places like Newcastle, Liverpool, Cashula, uh, Campbelltown, Wagga Wagga, and now Bankstown. Campbelltown produced these books and their stories of the the uh, the subjects in them and their their stories of their lives and tales. Similarly with, similarly with the Bankstown, they've got this out as well. So, and they've got a lot of their own images of their lives and, and, and stories that they tell. I think it's a wonderful way of um, sort of dealing with life. Um, whether they, they call it reconciliation or whether they call it something else. But um, it's, it's very nice to share a lot of their lives with, with other folk. Um, 
some years ago down in Canberra doing pictures at Sorry Day. Um, and that was that was that was pretty uh, pretty big sort of a day. I've done some pictures also with State Records, um, with an exhibition called In Living Memory. State Records have now relocated out to um, from down at the rocks out to the head office out at Kingswood. My grandmother, grandfather, it's wedding. 19, 1925, a little place called New Angledore, up northwest of New South Wales. The two bridesmaids are um, Lulu and Dory, Dory Simpson. Dory is Marge Little's mother, Jimmy's wife. So we, we're connected. Kangaroo cousins, as Uncle Victor George Chapman would say, kangaroo cousins. Of, uh, if you think about reconciliation and as Joanna said it's kind of a, a tricky word um, I always thought it, that, that, that could have had a better name another another name but uh, because all I can think about is balancing the books <laughs> back in high school days and uh, these days, um, I try to do what I can, but um, and wherever I go, I was always try and tell a nice story and engage with people to um, get their stories, um, and maybe we can do this later. But um, you know. As an artist, as a person, Australian, as an Aboriginal man, yeah. You know, you sort of think, wow, I'm, I'm mixed, I'm, I'm all of this. And, uh, and uh, I, felt, I feel that like I've, I've had a, a good life. There's been heartaches and stuff going on like, like everybody else, but uh, Oh, I think I'd better wind up before I, before I burst into tears. So thank you for your indulgence and uh, hope to see you all again sometime. And may I say, Mayu Yanana, which means, and language out there means travel safe. Hi everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, I was born in Glasgow and uh, brought up in the western suburbs of Sydney. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, fr from some people's point of view, I've actually got no. You know, some people see that I've got no right to work in the way that I do. Um, but I don't feel like I've got any choice. A um, few things have happened to me that I, I don't have any, you know, real explanation about. Um, when I was an a eight-year-old at school, I refused to see the Queen. Um, my family weren't like that at all. Uh, they had no particular opinion, but I was... Uh, they said, why don't you want to see the Queen? It was like a school excursion, the entire school was going, and I just said, I just don't believe in what she stands for and stayed home um, and you know my life I, I always was a little bit like that I had really strong feelings about um, just really strong feelings about things to do with what I saw was uh, was true or you know was fair um, anyway and I also so my work now is about is is pretty much post-colonial, um, and deals with all the issues of colonisation and imperialism, um, and it also has you know it's quite intuitive and it has a lot of feeling in it as well. I also use humour um, to get my point across some of the time, sometimes not. Um, when I think of the colonials on the twenty sixth of January in, in seventeen eighty eight. 
and the ceremony where they were singing uh, the English national, national anthem or whatever similarly patriotic uh, song, um, planting their flag, I always think that they took unlawful possession of the land. Um, and I always, whenever I think about it, I feel a little bit hysterical, um, like it was a scene of a crime. Um, and I see the land as Aboriginal. I don't, and so when, and this sort of happened, it, it wasn't, I didn't feel like that when I was eight, you know, but eventually I started to understand with a certain type of, um, as I started to get a connection to uh, the environment and the land myself, I started to feel it. Um, when I'm at, my, my father lives up the coast and he lives near a national park beach and when I'm floating in the water and looking back at the land I can't see any houses and I, and I can't, I can only ever think about what that was like to, for there to be no houses and, and the impact of colonisation. Like I can't, I, I can't even, you know, I have to go underwater to stop thinking about it. <laughs> um, so I wasn't always doing work like this. As like I said, a few different things happened that aren't really explicable. Um, now this was a, a work which is um, a nude picture of Cook on kangaroo fur. Uh, there is clothes on the ground. This was entered in a reconciliation prize. And it was down in Canberra and we flew down there and I'd, I'd been selected. I was one of the 40 artists selected, Indigenous, non-Indigenous. Um, we went down there and it had travelled from the National Archives into the National Museum. And when my art dealer and myself walked in and we looked around, my work wasn't there. And so we started to question why the work wasn't there. Um, so did everyone else, in, because it was on the pamphlet and there was only three works missing. Um, over the period of the next two days, I got five different excuses from the uh, head of the Public Service Commission um, through to the head of the archives as to why it wasn't there. Pretty much it wasn't there because it was a nude picture of Captain Cook. Then the work um, uh, went into an art prize in a building in the city and within a day and a half was taken out because the building committee didn't appreciate a nude picture of Captain Cook. So, <laughs> I mean, these sorts of things are just like, you know, you would think that, and at the same time there were works where there were, you know, um, 3D rotting cows in plaster cast on the walls and, you know, and yet they wouldn't allow that work in the, in the building. So, you know, these sorts of things just spurred me on a little bit further. Uh, yeah. So, right computer. I saw this on Facebook this morning. Did anyone else? <laughs> Tess? <laughs> Didn't see it. Um, that is, I mean, I found that, uh, I find that incredibly disturbing, that picture. I think that's, a, you know, a red wood or a sea or something like that. That sort of sums up my feeling about what I feel colonisation's done. There's none of those trees left now. Um, oh, I just find it so, I find that just uh, incredibly hurtful. And look at the, that saw is incredible. <laughs> At the same time. Okay. This is one of my earlier works, which is it's uh, it, it's actually not much smaller. It's about that size, and it's it's the apparently and you know this has been in dispute. The first land grant ever given to an Aboriginal person, and it was given to Colby, and it was a part of Blacktown. Now I actually I went I hand did that, I didn't project it or anything and I, and, and as I was making it up, I just, it, the whole thing just, it just horrified me so incredibly, I mean, which is why I did it in the first place. Um, and I did it on fake wood grain lino just to exaggerate its absolute invalidity from my point of view. And I just think that that, that is absolutely, it's just a travesty, it just doesn't, it can't even exist 
to me. So anyway, you start to get, oh, you know, I feel quite strongly about these sorts of things. Uh, this is a, um, a small section. It's out of focus because actually it's in reality it's about uh, an, a centimetre and a half high. Um, it's a section of a Lycett painting. And in a lot of Lycett's paintings he had, um, he would have his figures pointing towards the land as if it was their land, like my land. And so I did a few works based on that. Um, these works are, you'll see that's the ground there, these are three metre high works. And that's two lots of them together. And it's, the, the pink one is called, Oh, look along my stick at our land. Uh, it's a little sarcastic and um, so I've also been working a, around boundaries as well. So um, I made the, um, these um, bollards with kangaroo fur in between them to talk about land and, and the rest. This is a, um, the first of a series of three works called Shall We Dance? And these are the shadows of uh, an Aboriginal um, bride doll and a colonial man dancing. This is their shadows projected onto a landscape painting. And so in some sort of ways, I, I guess the way, how I work is that I, I want to, I want to talk about this, I want to open it up as a conversation to people. Uh, occasionally people pick me up on things, they say, you know, should you be doing that, should you be doing this, you know, um, and I'm, I'm as sensitive as I can be, um, but I still continue to do it um, a, as sensitively as I can because I think that we need to open up the discussion um, and I think that there's maybe not enough, you know, there's a little bit of a fear sometimes from, from non-Indigenous people to do it um, and occasionally I feel it myself, you know, Tessa's got a ruler out. And <laughs> Anything could happen. <laughs> anyway, now I, he, I'm just about to show you three. Uh, this is my, I've got an exhibition opening in Hobart in about 10 days. And these are a few of the stills from it. I use, um, I'm going to show you a, a video. These are, I use high vis fluoro as a, a link it to colonisation because high vis after 9 11 and the increase in OHS. Uh, has actually invaded and colonised us with a type of fear. And so I started to use that. So that's um, an image of Botany Bay with uh, a cocoon that's got... Oh, it's been cut off a little bit, actually. Uh, there's reasons for that, don't worry. Um, and there's a little glowing bit of fluoro inside it. I think that one speaks for itself. And this is, um, that's Hobart. So that guy, this is, it's called the Butterfly Murderer. And um, he's just caught the, the rare butterfly. Okay. And now I'm going to show you my, a video called Barbecue This Sunday, BYO. This is a Joseph Lyset painting, and I've changed the flag. So what I've been doing is reconfiguring the works and changing, changing how um, things may have been, just slightly, and bringing up. And also, I, I purposely do it with, a, like I said, a little bit of humour, and with some traditional paintings so that we are not always preaching to the converted so that the, the general public actually can enjoy it as well and children <laughs> that's a ceramic uh, the ceramic figurines with slinkies on their head they got a designer handbag and a barrel of rum <laughs> That's what content. 
and his girlfriend. <laughs> So in this case, for me, the, the Aborigin, Aboriginals have invited the Colonials to the barbecue. And I've changed their flags on this to mean carrying, uh, we want to communicate and carrying dangerous cargo. There's a prize if anyone can recognise what the song is. And there's a blob coming down. There's been a blob coming down the hill, a blob of fluoro, a blob of colonisation. <laughs> They're kangaroo sausages with pine nuts. And in amongst these spirographs, there's a smallpox molecule down near the bottom. I mean, you don't need to know all these things in a way. Okay, so that's it. Thank you, Mervyn, and thank you, Joan. Uh, if I ever want to think of a definition of reconciliation, I'll think of both of you, and uh, I'll think of uh, artists doggedly and persistently working with the, the heart and with the head, because that would be, I think, a workable idea of what reconciliation is or its gestures. Uh, it was interesting, my street, Joanna's titled this two-way street, my street actually had two sets of banners. On one side there was reconciliation, on the other side there was vivid, which seems to say to me that maybe there's somebody is saying that reconciliation is not vivid, which rather kind of amusingly sums up the scenario that often plays out and... Um, Joan has alluded to it in some ways within the contemporary art world is that somehow or another um, issues like reconciliation are seen as not vivid, not new, not now. And I'll return to that. Um, the present moment though, um, 
If everybody's seen the latest football scandal, the um, the calling of the football star um, by a 13-year-old an ape, um, segued nicely, I thought, back to Michael Riley's famous series, They Call Me Nigger, in 1995, so 20 years on. So if you want to think about where we've been on this arc of uh, official, as Mervyn called it, Reconciliation, I don't think it's official. I think reconciliation is profoundly unofficial. And I think Bannadam is telling us that, that you know, reconciliation is the dark, still the dark side of the street. It's not the vivid side of the street. But um, there are many, um, and most of them are artists who um, persistently want to stay on the dark side. So this is a little contribution to um, what is now horrifically renamed, um, but quite brilliantly renamed by um, John Altman at the ANU, um, co uh, coercive reconciliation. Uh, this is what happens when the state decides it will deliver reconciliation to you. Uh, it's an exhibition that uh, I co-curated about the middle of last year with um, John Mundine, who is tonight opening his exhibition Bungaree at Port Macquarie. So a link with Joan and Macquarie and it's all happening and Mervyn, star of it. And uh, so I feel a bit fraudulent, um, but it does give me a liberty to talk about this project. And uh, John is kind of the poetic side of this uh, double act. Here's the ghosts. And I'm the more historicist one. I'm the clipboard one with the, you know, what are we witnessing here kind of questionnaire for everybody. Uh, this is currently on in Melbourne. And this is kind of like the, become the title page of the exhibition. Because uh, what we've found is, is our an initial intervention uh, was at the time, it was, it was an intervention into the Sydney Biennale. And what we wanted to do was to tell artists, in our foreign guests in the Biennale, that here in Australia the artists they may be exhibiting beside may not have equal rights, uh, may not be a citizen, an equal citizen of this country. And we were very gratified to have, um, at the opening, to have the curators and so many of the artists from the Biennale turn up. Um, and of course, the, the, within an art context, the idea of an intervention um, is uh, us celebrating our, you know, polyvocality, the, the freedom in the spaces, the, the way we can mix the difference between art, architecture, urban planning, for example. We're using it here entirely without irony and entirely about um, something that is unfree and unequal. And this we found, we had to work out ourselves as reasonably well-informed urban folk um, what this was all about. And we found many people do not even understand the basics, including people in Darwin. And the basics is this, the basics card that Brendan Penzer here um, uh, has made an artwork out of which is handed out at each of these exhibitions and the verso of this little card, your basics card, um, says um, that the person in possession of a basics card has, uh, has lost all their basic human rights, basic human dignity and basic, servant, um, basic services. Uh, so you've forfeited all of this. The card is designed to shame, stigmatise and marginalise the person who holds it. Now there are 13,000 Australians who have these cards. Uh, and that's quite an extraordinary... And then you start to think of what is this about when there are so many people, uh, and this is the play in the term witnessing, um, it starts to then have a far broader international meaning when you start to talk about art and human rights. And then you start to think of all of that modernist art which talks about these sorts of programs, state-enforced power are on people. And what happens with these cards is you have to shop at, at certain places. And um, Rachel McDinney here is modelling her new basics gown. We still don't know whether or not you can actually buy art with your basics card, but basically you can buy flour, water, sugar and damper which everybody will know whether have been the staples of the colonial diet and the staples of rations on 
uh, in p the pastoral economy, uh, of which people like great heroes like Vincent Lingiari uh, were part of that, of that huge economy. Um, and that's really what you can buy with your basics card. It, the government actually tells you what you can and can't buy. Initially, where you could shop, Coles or Woolworths, uh, and prescribed conditions like reporting on a weekly basis, which meant that in the Northern Territory, the game is to reduce the number of settlements from about 600 to about 15 service centres. So this is a sort of social engineering or political engineering on a, a, a scale that is not unprecedented. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, ironically this is going on while we're about to get a Royal Commission, another Royal Commission into um, uh, the abuse of children and the, the Royal Commission before that of course was bringing them home and supposedly ironically uh, which does tend to prove people like George Orwell prescient um, this is really um, a response to, to bringing them home or is built as a response to bringing them home and uh, the, these prints here which were printed at Cicada Press here at, here at COFA um, Vernon R. Key. And again, this gets down to the willfulness of artists, the ornery little beasts that they are, or perhaps the follower of the three, the five Ps, persistence, um, keep turning up with works about post-colonial issues, with works about human rights issues, and with works ar around other equality, gender equality issues. So there's a sort of thing about thinking with the head and the heart that uh, is something that does seem to be endemic uh, to art making, and perhaps why you know kind of artists are uh, in, in Australia particularly are kept at uh, the fringes and margins. This particular exhibition that we've put together actually starts with, um, in a sense, a historical uh, echo because the ghosts, of course, are the ghosts of interventions past, starting with 1788. <laughs> And there are two themes in the exhibition, um, the ghosts of the past uh, and the actual intervention itself. So that's the, the sort of curatorial dialogue. So the uh, video work here in the foreground, just in this showcase as you come into the gallery by Deborah Vaughan, is actually an, a video she made in Martin Place in um, just a few years ago with the apology to the Stolen Generations. Uh, in 2008 and you can see as she pans around the video that most of those people there are actually crying it's, it's a slow motion video and uh, so that's really about the betrayal of people's hopes for reconciliation and about people having their hopes trampled into the ground by this sort of political cynicism and um, techniques of in a sense, political division, um, you know, within playing out and acting out political positions. So that's that's the kind of entry point in, into this whole dialogue. But we do go into various colonial uh, ghostings, hauntings, spiritings, and the like. Um, one of the main speakers. We also are collecting with this, so we see it a bit as a bit as an archive. We're collecting talks where people have spoken because what we're concerned about is that people within this government program are being silenced uh, and you don't get access to the media. Uh, in the Australian there are four voices who are heard uh, and they're all voices who are fanatically pro the intervention. So nobody else commenting, even the basic evaluation of this program, is it effective, is it not? You never see this in the media. And um, monitors have been sacked uh, when they've produced reports critical of the intervention. Most recently, Olga Havnan in the Northern Territory, who brought out a report uh, saying that there, was no, there were no guidelines, there was no uh, evaluation of this program. You know, how on earth could you be running a program that's costing billions? Uh, each of these cards costs the government $8,000 a year and the beneficiary gets $13,000. So that multiplied that and you know we're very quickly up to the half a billion dollar mark uh, with all the indicators from all the reports saying that the outcomes are all falling, that there have been some improvements in some areas with Indigenous health, but they were areas that have been historically underfunded. So I think you know there, there is certainly a vested interest, it seems to me, but returning to our uh, eminent speakers, 
Um, this is Rosemary Kunoth Monks speaking at, uh, and so what we find again going back to the very early days of the fight for citizenship rights, say about 1938, uh, is that we're re we are relegated to the margins. We're speaking from the cold community hall, uh, that we're speaking with pamphlets. Um, this is a small gallery in Melbourne called Arena. Uh, which has hosted two special issues. They fundraised it themselves on the intervention and they flew Ro Ro um, Rosalie down from Alice Springs to speak. And Rosalie um, is one of the leaders of her nation and was famously, the, uh, is also an actor, very most famously is Jeddah uh, in the Chevelle film. And she is describing in this uh, what the it was like the day the intervention came to Utopia. Uh, and he, uh, uh, Kali Kamare actually describes, this is quite an extraordinary image, uh, and this gets down to the, the role of the artist in catastrophe or in crisis is the idea of being a visual witness. And she is actually describing the coming of the troops and the police to her community. This is the central um, hub of the utopia communities. Uh, Kaki, of course, is the Australian military. And she says that most people, um, the immediate reaction was just pure horror. Most people thought that this was the stolen generations, that they had come for the children. Um, and this is supposedly all being justified. So you can just imagine to people, communities who were already traumatised, the cynical replaying of this trauma twice and what that actually means. So the other works here, um, I'll get you a detail close up here. This is um, Alison Alder and she happened to be, none of these artists, all of these artists were working independently of each other. Uh, as a curator, you know, our na the natural way that we work is, you know, we, c we commission something, we say, here's the theme, you know, to go away, here's some, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, you know, go and fund it, you know, and then top it up with your own money and off you go, uh, given the, the generous arts grants that we have. but. These artists have done uh, of, out of their own initiative and you know, with, with, you know, simply because they feel so strongly about w what is going on. Uh, Alison is a printmaker and runs Megalo Print Workshop in Canberra. The, uh, and what she's the, um, the Times, uh, the Tenant Times, which didn't even report on the intervention, even though the half of the community in Tenant I is black. Uh, and this was, you know, I mean, you've got the Australian Army in the main street. I mean, duh. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with this picture here? You know, what do you think is going on? And there's, there's nothing in the, in the local paper. Uh, the carcass, uh, if you think of the Australian modernists, the, uh, the, all of the endless carcasses, this is talking about terra nullius, which is that schematic sketch over it. Uh, power bill, these are the commodities you again can buy with your basics and at each venue there are usually discussions about the prices at the uh, food land and how inflated they are. <laughs> mm. uh, Fiona Foley who's one of the ghosts of the voices past and uh, a tr of a, basically of atrocities past. This is a, an earlier film, um, Bliss. And the poppies, uh, cultivated poppies in, in Tasmania. And uh, what she's talking about essentially are uh, the imperial opium trade, which flourished in Australia and most of the colonial countries in a, from about oh, 1860s, 1870s. Uh, and this, this was tied in with, of course, slavery and enforced slavery through opium addiction. Um, and in, uh, in um, central Queensland of um, Aboriginal populations as well as you know, imported Chinese and Kanaks. Other witnesses here, um, these are artists um, who have been displaced into the, the camp communities around Alice Springs. Uh, and there's a remarkable art centre there called um, Tanganjere Artists, which uh, works with a lot of these artists in the 15 town camps, which are all divided, of course, linguistically. Uh, and racially. And uh, the two artists, uh, Amy Naparula and Dan Jones, are actually traditional painters who've changed from an abstract style to, to describe these, the coming and going of the government mobs and um, 
you know, the, in a sense, the futility of their efforts, as you can see how uh, overpowering the, the landscape is. And I love the way Dan Jones has painted a truck as a mm -hmm. movable painting. Um, Sally Mulder is, is more of a naive or un untutored artist, and she actually does a daily diary uh, of what she sees, and it's mostly but straight up good old-fashioned police harassment down in the riverbeds, um, which is not surprising when you look at the shocking and you know, the recent report on um, Indigenous incarceration, particularly in the Territory, which is in the 90% or something. It's quite um, extraordinary. Uh, again, um, you know, with a type of show like this, um, really what it's calling on is a, a response from the head uh, and from the heart. And the most basic um, area, I guess, of you know, witnessing or reenacting is when you physically put on, uh, and the colonial signifier par excellence being the breastplate, which Jason Wing puts on here. Uh, as in, how would I feel if this was me? And this is part of a triptych, criminal, alcoholic and pedophile, and there's a whole history to the, the banning of um, his pedophile work in various public uh, venues, uh, not dissimilar to, to Joan's experience recounting the banning of the, um, the skinny dipping Mr Cook, Captain Cook. Uh, and um, Bindi Cole, of course, um, that would have to be, you know, almost a classic reconciliation um, image because she's talking about uh, conciliation within her family uh, and the, you know, personal healing within her family. That's her and her father, and that's on their um, their land. And look, this is just sort of flashback time here, good old fashioned flashbacks. Um, the, these these are the talks at the times of the Biennale, and these are some of the people who. Uh, spoke um, Hetty Perkins, of course, rather memorably at the launch of one of the issue, the Indigenous in indignation issue of um, Artlink. Uh, Hetty actually spoke about her fear that she thinks that with this intervention, that there may be communities and cultures that may not be strong enough to survive this. Because what happened on the night of the opening of the Sydney Biennale was that while we all partied on Cockatoo Island in an empty Senate chamber, about late at night, about 11 or 12 o'clock, they extended the intervention for another 10 years, uh, which makes a total of 15 years, or effectively the, the lifetime of a young generation. And so we are talking now about cultural change and cultural transmission over generations. And you know, can cultures, particularly remote cultures, be strong enough to withstand these sorts of impacts? So it's not, not, it's not something that's light. Um, and perhaps on that tone um, of you know, coercive reconciliation, Joanna can have the panel. Great. Thank you.